This is Winchester Academy. Good evening. I'm Richard Bidwell. I'm the uh, president of the Winchester Academy Board of Trustees. And we welcome you this evening to the community program that is being co-sponsored by the Wapaka Area Public Library, the Wapaka Historic, the Wapaka Breakfast Rotary Club, and the Winchester Academy. Pretty good when you can get four groups to uh, work together and uh, find an evening that we could come together. When Phil gave this uh, program at Rotary meeting perhaps a month or so ago, I uh, said to a few people, this program really needs uh, a wider audience, and tonight is the result of that. We thank the library for providing the uh, beverages, the Historical Society bought the cookies, and Vanell from the uh, Winchester is our hostess, and there is a basket on the table, and uh, if you are so inclined, any cash that shows up in that basket will be given to the Rotary International Student Exchange Program. Please silence your cell phones or any other digital devices. Patsy from the library will help you if you need assistance doing that, but we really would appreciate you taking just a moment now to silence those items. A few announcements. The next movie at the library with Dr. Rhodes is Thursday, this coming Thursday, and it's Walt Disney's So Dear to My Heart Thursday, 1.30 in the afternoon. In the Historical Society's next program is on Thursday evening, April 18th at 6 p.m. at the Hobby Center. Interesting program, 40 Years of the Chain Skiers. Might be good. Winchester Academy's next program is in two weeks, Monday at 6.30 in this room. So, we also need to vacate this room by quarter to eight. Uh, with the size of the crowd, keep in mind there are two exits. Each of one will lead you to either a staircase or an elevator. And um, my experience has been if you leave, then don't just stand out there because then nobody else can get out. I remember the old days at the Boston store going down the escalator. You know, if they didn't keep moving, uh, you were in trouble. This time I'd like to introduce Brett Grams. He's the Rotary Youth Exchange, Offi Exchange Officer, and he'll introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you, Dick. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this night's uh, speaker. As our Rotary Exchange Officer, um, I get to work with a great group of uh, Exchange Committee volunteers, all of us who are dedicated to our Exchange Program. Uh, and tonight, we're going to hear from one of our three uh, ex uh, inbound Exchange students that we have with us. Um, we ask all of our Exchange students to immerse themselves in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, they, they each live with three different families in Wapaka and also attend our high school. These students come from all over the world to share a year of their life in our community. We are grateful that our Rotary members, our community, our host families, thank you, and uh, our schools support our exchange program uh, at the level that this high level. Um, these young people bring a wealth of information and culture that we do not easily get to experience in central Wisconsin. One of the duties that we've asked our inbound students is to be an ambassador to their culture and country. Tonight, you'll get to hear from a young person who is a wonderful ambassador for Germany. Upon Phil's arrival uh, to Wapaka last August, it became evident that Phil enjoys politics, history, and I was always happy to share those ideas with anyone that wanted to listen. Phil is only 16, but he has an impressive grasp of his nation's political system. He spent last summer interning for a member of the German parliament. Besides politics, Phil has also created, designed, and edited his own successful magazine that he started in 2017. He's an accomplished tennis player, loves downhill skiing, 
and most recently became a connoisseur of American cuisine with a special interest in barbecue ribs. <laughs> in addition to his full load of subjects at Wapaka High School, Phil managed the high school hockey team this winter and is currently playing high school baseball. <laughs> He's excited to attend our junior prom this weekend as a member of the prom court. And Phil is the oldest of two boys in his family and resides with his parents in Potsdam, Germany, which is just outside of Berlin. Please give a warm welcome to Phil Karstensen. Thank you, Brett. Uh, I also want to thank you, the Wopeka Rotary Club, and of course the Winchester Academy for making all of this possible. Also, thank you to you for showing up. Um, I really appreciate your time, and um, yeah, let's jump right into the topic. Now, I grew up in former East Germany. I had a fairly normal life. I had the freedom of travel. I could go to the Melodives with my parents. And all those freedoms, all those things, were things that I always took for granted. You know, they were just there. But if, if, if it wasn't for the no November 9th, 1989, the story could have gone very, very differently. That was the date that the Berlin Wall, after years of oppression, finally was torn down, and people of East Germany could, for maybe the first time in their life, experience freedom. That's why today we will be talking about the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and its causes. just want to give you a quick overview here. What we'll be covering today, we'll jump in uh, to the history, then we'll look at the causes, then we'll have a look at November 9th, what exactly happened on that day, um, the important events that led to that date, the GDR at its end, the life in the e GDR, Earth, East Germany now, where can we still see economic differences, what has the German government done to kind of equalize them, how has it impacted my family, and last but not least, the heritage. To understand the history of the German division, we need to start earlier than 1989. We need to start in 1945. And that was the end of the Second World War, as you all know. And Germany was, of course, in a very difficult situation. They lost an awful war um, as a fascist state and um, were completely destroyed, especially the urban areas, basic infrastructure was gone. Um, and um, in the decision how to divide Germany, how to further proceed with Germany, was a major miscalculation by the American government. And that comes all down to the question, how long is it appropriate to clap for someone? Maybe minutes, maybe two, one might even say three. However, do you think it's appropriate to clap for someone for 11 minutes? Well. That probably wasn't even enough in the opinion of Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was the authoritarian leader of the Soviet Union. We all know him today for his um, also very, very, um, you know, uh, awful uh, crimes that he, have done, that he has done on the population, his oppressive uh, leading style, and many other things. Um, at a um, local convention uh, of the Communist Party, um, they were having a standing ovation in the... Uh, in honor of Joseph Stalin. And the crowd kept clapping and clapping and clapping. They didn't clap because they loved Joseph Stalin so much, because out of fear, out of sheer fear, they knew if they would stop clapping, there was the secret police, and um, they would probably f uh, suffer some major consequences. Around that time, there were 1,000 executions a day for political enemies. However, being a political enemy meant that you could be part of the Communist Party, that you could be a, a very close relative, a very um, close friend of Joseph Stalin. Eventually, after 11 minutes, a local factory owner sat down. He faced severe consequences and was sent to the Gulag for 10 years. And this is the Stalin we know today. And um, probably terrified, maybe seen as a necessary evil, at the Potsdam conference, Roosevelt offered Stalin to invade Berlin um, to continue a possible partnership after the Second World War. Now, we know that the story went a little different than a good partnership after the Second World War. Um, however, he, he did that back then, um, and in the U.S. media, Joseph Stalin, until the 40s, was portrayed as Uncle Joseph. So that's something very interesting. Um, 
So they divided up um, Germany like that. That's probably the map we all know. Um, then we had the Soviet sector, we had the British sector, the French and the American sector. Now, Joseph Stalin thought that the Western allies would soon leave and Germany would never become a democracy again. Luckily, he was wrong. And um, this is the division that we can see now of, uh, of Berlin. So again, in those uh, four sectors. Um, however, it took a while until the Western allies arrived in Berlin. And um, there's this very iconic picture that you probably also all know from the history books. Um, one of the most iconic pictures of the end of Second World War, it's a Soviet soldier. Um, that picture, by the way, is also it's, it's more propaganda picture than it is an authentic picture. However, it is very, very, very iconic. Um, the soldier is waving the communist flag on the German parliament, the Reichstagsgebäude. And um, when the Soviets came to Berlin, they were out for revenge. It did not matter that only 70, that 75 percent of Berlin's population at that time were women and children. The public opinion didn't matter, but they were out for revenge. And if you look what the Nazis did them, that's also in a certain way understandable. They burned down their villages, did horrible things. Um, however, the American soldiers were shocked when they uh, first went into Berlin and saw over thousands, thousands of corpses still unburied months after the war ended. There was this saying between women, um, if they met each other after a week, after a few days, saying how many times. And that didn't refer to how many times did you go to the grocery store, how many times did you do whatever. It referred to how many times did you get raped since the last time we met by a Soviet soldier. And that just portrays this um, brutal and bad situation. However, life in East Germany soon started to normalize and so did it in West Germany as well. Um, the rebuilding began, it uh, mainly uh, happened in the out, out, out of the out downtown areas, uh, especially uh, in East Germany. Um, however, there was no split between East and West Berlin yet. yet. Yes, we had the, the, the line going through, however, it was a very fluent transition. People used to live in East Berlin and work in West Germany. It was normal. Despite the political differences, the, despite the differences in currency, government, and ideology, it seemed somewhat sustainable. Um, in 1949, East Germany was created officially after the BRD, the um, West Germany, officially announced uh, its uh, independency by having the Grundgesetz or constitution officially recognized. Um, with that, we can already see a division between East and West. The Berlin Wall wasn't there back then. However, there, there were many, many barriers um, here ensuring that no one from East Germany could go over to West Germany. So that barrier that existed before the Berlin Wall and um, had a tremendous impact already. However, the West German economy was thriving. We had the Wirtschaftswunder. Um, so over time, more and more people left from the East for the West. 54,000 in 1949, 340,000 in 1953, and once the Wirtschaftswunder officially hit in 1958, almost 100 people a day left. Um, and of course, a country, if it needs anything, it needs people. So um, that was a big, big problem for the economy, for the GDR, that was weak already, and they really just couldn't afford people leaving. Now, they were thinking about a pros possible solution, and after they got approval from the Soviet Union, they come, came up with this simple and yet very efficient idea to just build a wall between East and West, so um, it, it would become uh, impossible to get over. Because until then, yes, you had the barrier between East and West, but if you should ever live, if you, if you were living in East Germany and you had enough of the system, you always had the chance to go over to West Germany. West Germany was this interesting bird cage of freedom. As long as you were inside, you had all the freedoms, but as soon as you left, you would lose them because they were uh, indeed surrounded by East Germany. So those plans were going on, and soon rumors occurred because um, they have been leaks. So Walter Ulbricht the head of the uh, East German government was asked by a, a journalist at a UN press conference now, if they have any intention, if, there are any, if there's anything true behind that rumor that there's a wall going to be built between East and West Germany. And he responded, no, no one has the intention to build a wall. And that became the lie of the decade. And exactly two months after he said that, overnight they started the construction. They took 40,000 soldiers all around East Germany, sent them to East Berlin, and only top government officials knew what was going on. 
And on that night, they opened the letter and they were shocked by what they read. On the night of Aug between August 12th and August 13th, they were sent to the border and started the construction of the wall. And the next morning, people woke up suddenly, being separated from their families, from their jobs, from their hopes and possible futures. Now, the first Berlin Wall and also the final Berlin Wall wasn't very impressive. Um, the first one wasn't a huge barrier. However, the entire structure that we had in the end was highly efficient and became an almost impossible barrier to overcome. The wall itself was only 12 foot tall and, you know, someone could say, okay, show me a 12 foot wall, I'll show you a 13 foot ladder. However, the entire system behind that was so highly efficient that Unfortunately, hundreds of people lost their lives in the attempt to cross the wall. So now here we can see that in West Berlin, it was just that, a wall. People could walk close to it. People even started painting on, on it. People could even look over the wall to kind of take a sneak peek how, how the East could look like. And then the exact opposite in East Berlin. Living here, on so close to the death stripe already, meant that you were either very close to the government or they would constantly spy on you, the police. And um, they would also have... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. They would also have constant ID controls to ensure that the people that are over there, close to the border already, are only those who are supposed to be there. Then we have those guard towers, over 300 of them over the course of the Berlin Wall, it, equipped with soldiers who would have guns and could sh shoot at those people. Also self-shooting um, uh, mechanism mechanisms were added later. And we have those two walls earlier, and then we have this death stripe. The death stripe was full with landmines, so if you would step on something wrong, you would die. Um, the, wall, it's, the Berlin Wall itself wasn't just a wall, it was a complete mechanism of imprisoning people in the end. Now, of course, Berlin was a place of tension, of international tension. It was the meltdown of the Cold War, one could say, and we saw the beginning of a World War III, now World War III, I wouldn't use that term, but of a uh, of, of the outbreak of, the, uh, of a hot war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union many times. For example, once at Checkpoint Charlie, when, the US, when East Germany <coughs> wouldn't let in a U.S. diplomat. So tanks from, uh, from the United States and the Soviet Union have been facing each other for hours after JFK, John F. Kennedy finally resolved that conflict. So for him, seeing the Berlin Wall was not only a physical but also a diplomatic barrier, kind of relaxing that situation a little. And it took him a while to come to Berlin. Only Willy Brandt, the former mayor and chancellor of Germany, finally convinced him to come over and to look, take a look at the situation. And John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy in 1965 saw something that really, really moved him. It wasn't the overwhelming crowds. He was a very good US president. He certainly was used to having big crowds. It also wasn't a warm welcome from Willy Brandt. It was when he looked over the Berlin Wall looked over to the east side on a protest and he could see East Germans protesting for him, despite the risks of losing their lives, of losing their families, of losing their jobs, they still stood up for what they thought was right. And that moved him so much that he wrote down this famous quote, Ich bin ein Berliner, I am a Berliner or Jelly Donut, depending on your interpretation of the <laughs> German language. Um, so he wrote that down and after he gave his moving speech about freedom, about what it means to be a free man, a Berliner. He got an, the, the crowd applauded for him for over 20 minutes. Now that's an interesting contrast um, to 11 minutes and they did not have to fear anything. So let's talk about the summer that changed everything. The summer that changed the face of East Germany, the face of Europe and pretty much the face of the world. It was the summer of 1989 and people the, the Eastern Bloc slowly started to fall, the Iron Curtain started to get thinner and thinner, and people in East Germany started to go on the streets under the slogan, we are the people, wir sind das Volk. Um, now let's take a look at the causes, and I think the interesting thing about this peaceful revolution that we saw taking place in uh, East Berlin and East Germany uh, is that it wasn't a unified revolution. Of course, yeah, there were smaller unifications, certainly, but it were many small events that in the end led to the fall of the Berlin Wall on that particular night. So that's something very interesting. Also, the fact that it was peaceful is truly remarkable. It could have gone very, very different. Uh, not a single gunshot was fired on the night of November 9th, 1989. It could have gone 
been a bloody, bloody uh, attempt to 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 uh, seek freedom, but it didn't. Um, but it wasn't, and I think it's something truly remarkable talking about that. Um, so let's. Of course, there was the people's wish for freedom. There were protests, and um, in the end, it really came down to every single individual, every person who had the courage, who had the braveness to go out and say, "No, I, I want to stand up for what's right, and I don't want to follow those policies by the SED, by the Socialistic Party of Germany. I want to fight for my right, for my freedom." And yes, I might risk my job, I might risk my family, and I might risk my good life here, but you know, there's something far, far greater than that, that's freedom. So that was um, a big thing. We saw protests emerging over 4,000 people, and in the end, they, the protests couldn't be stopped. Um, but that, that, that is only one of the many reasons. Uh, many citizens also request to leave the GDR. Now, leaving the GDR via request was always possible. However, there was a great disadvantage. It needs to get approved. And um, that also meant that if, you, if it wouldn't get approved, they knew that you were an enemy of the socialistic system. You would lose your job, your family members would lose their job, you would lose privileges, and you would be constantly watched by the German secret police. So requesting that was a big, big deal. Um, the occupation of the West German embassy in Prague, now that was a very historic moment, um, because in the German constitution, West German constitution, in 1949, already said, we think of Germany as one. We don't see the divided Germany, and we do recognize all East German citizens as West German citizens. And they might not have thought about much when I wrote that down back then. However, it laid the foundation for the later reunification and made also this event possible. Um, thousands of East Germans went to the embassy in Prague and you know, um, wanted to go to West Germany. It was a diplomatic crisis. They didn't know what to do. They you know, were afraid it would cause conflict and friction. Um, but in the end, they were able to leave. Now here you can see the embassy in Prague. And I will show you a video in a second. You can see those huge crowds. They've been there for days um, with their family, sleeping in tents, and just waiting for this one final sentence. And this was their reaction when they got that one final sentence. Now, it's always a little... And they're saying, we are coming to you today to tell you that today, and today you can leave. And you can see the crowds just screaming. That was around the German embassy, you know, um, packed with people. And they knew they would finally be able to leave and go to West Germany. Okay. Um, but that wasn't the final event. Um, on November 9th, 1989, Günther Schabowski was giving a press conference. Now, there are certain rumors that um, Mr. Schabowski might have had a few drinks, too many, the night before that. So he came into that press conference, maybe with a slight hangover. He was maybe still drunk. And <laughs> he was, you know, but he just thought, okay, you know, I've done this many times, just business as usual. I'll just read those policies. And it was, you know, the. The, the press conference went on and on. All, everyone was almost asleep in that room because it was just like the boring, you know, boring socialistic news. Like the, the workers and farmers have achieved their production goal thanks to the means of production being in the hands of, the, you know. So the stuff that like, okay, yeah. Um, but then certainly that, that took a very, very rapid change uh, when um, he was talking about a new policy, a new policy that would allow all citizens of the GDR to leave East Germany without to request that. And of course that policy wasn't supposed to be there entirely. The story of that is very interesting and very long. How it started with a young communist revolutionist and ended up in his paper. It's a long journey, but it made it there. Um, but it was approved by the Politburo. It was kind of the, the upper level, political level of East Germany. And um, that policy was supposed to take place and it was supposed to take place uh, the a day after that co press conference. Now, um, if it would have taken place the day after, I think, personally, and now that's my conception of history, they probably would have realized what it would have done to East Germany and the GD uh, and East Berlin. Um, so it probably would have take, been taken out again. But as an uh, Italian journalist, I asked the right question at the right moment. He was asking, so when will that new policy take, in, uh, will take into effect? And then Günther Schabowski said a world-famous quote, 
with unfortunately a small grammatical error in it, but that's, that's the quote, so. Um, and he says that occurs to my knowledge, this is immediate, immediate. So we have this life-changing policy happening right now, no one at the border knew anything, and you can only imagine what a difficult situation it was. Now, the same night, thousands, millions of East and West Germans saw it on TV. And of course, I mean, it was a press conference. So um, they all went to the border, the East Germans, um, and wanted to leave. The pressure was tremendous. Yet the people who worked at the border also knew if they would do a mistake, that would have severe consequences on their future lives. Um, but the Bonholmer Straße was the first point, uh, first border crossing point to let the people out. And I think I could talk hours about how remarkable it was and how it moved and changed the people, how divided families could finally come together again and how people could live a free life after a generation of oppression. Um, I will just show you this video. And this is again Günther Schabowski talking in the background. People screaming, of course, at the border personal, and then when the borders were finally opened, the masses went out. And this is Walter Ulbricht saying no one has the intention to build a mower. And we've been waiting for so long, 28 years, since the construction of the ball wall. We've been waiting for this day since that. And today, we Germans are the happiest people on earth. Because it was so truly, truly unexpected. And then, of course, the Brandenburg Gate, always a very, very iconic place of that reunification process of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, you know, people just celebrating their freedom, their unity. Um, And people leaving in masses. Um, now I always get the, yeah, that's the place, uh, the Bornholmer crossing, Bornholmer Straße, um, where they first decided to let them through. There's a very interesting movie about that that really um, shows this, this process, two and a half hours, um, how the masses kept getting more and more, and um, how they um, yeah, proceeded with that decision, because after all, it was a very, very difficult, and yeah, world-changing decision that they had to make that night. And um, luckily they did the right one. They did not choose the guns. They chose to open the borders. Um, and that changed lives in the end. Um, and I often get this question, you know, why was there, or was there an immigration crisis, you know, all those East Germans coming to West Germany? And I think it's important to understand that people had their lives. They had their families. Their, 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 their you know, anchor point in life was in East Germany. However, they wanted to see the West. They wanted to have the opportunity to go to West Germany. They wanted to have the product diversity. They wanted to have the freedom of speech. So um, I was talking to my father, you know, um, what did you do the first two days uh, after the wall was drawn down? And, uh, he first quit his job. He was working for the <laughs> um, GDR military. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, went to Lübeck and to, went to a Scorpions concert. So, um, <laughs> the small change there, um, because, um, you know, one side of my family was very, very close to the German government, the other not so much. So, again, two opposites. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's something very interesting, I thought, and I think you can ask every German, where were you when, when the war was turned on? They could all give you an answer, because it really was such a um, moving moment and there's a great African wisdom that I always like to, to use to you know, kind of explain how, how, how did that peaceful revolution work in the end and um, it was unorganized. It was, there were, when it was no huge uh, resistance organization somewhere in the underground. I mean there was no opposition in general in the GDR. Those were brave individuals and I think um, this quote really is, is, fits it pretty well. Many small people who in many small places do many small things that can alter the face of the world. And it really, really did. Every single, single one who went out there, who fought for their freedom, for, for what was right, changed the world in the end. So let's take a look at East Germany at its end. Now, there's still a lot of historic controversy, controversy about this topic. Um, if East Germany was truly bankrupt, 
Um, and I would also be careful to connect the economic situation of East Germany with the fall of the Berlin Wall. However, I think we can say that the um, economic situation helped with the reunification. Um, the most production facilities in 1989 were really, really outdated and, and they were really not able to, complete, uh, to um, compete globally. Um, in general, the labor productivity was very, very low and the infrastructure was um, completely outdated as well. And um, those were you know, many reasons why um, the GDR couldn't compete globally anymore um, or and always had struggles competing globally. They had a few industries that worked out well and microelectronic is an example of that but still they had a very, very hard time um, doing that. Um, there were sh always shortages and um, the entire social system didn't work out. That is also the reason why in the end, um, you know, if you were a very, very old person in the GDR, um, they would often allow you to leave because that would, would be a relief for them because that would be one old person less for their social system, um, especially towards the end. Um, so they were really facing big, uh, big struggles. In general, it's always, you know, um, they had full employment, so every single person was employed, not maybe for their favorite job, for a job that they were assigned to. Um, the, but that, that also meant that people were doing, you know, that four people were doing a job that in West Germany would be done by one. So low labor productivity in general, very outdated infrastructure, many houses, especially in the downtown areas, weren't even electrified. Um, you would have to share bathrooms, you know, if you, if you were, would like live in a flat in the downtown areas. And they weren't renovated after the Second World War. So it was in general very gray. And then you had this exact opposite, of course, on the other side. And people in East Germany, and that's very interesting, they could receive Western TV. It was illegal, but everyone did it, you know. So um, um, they, they watched Western TV, they were fully aware they saw all the commercials, they know about Nivea, they knew about Coca-Cola, they knew about everything that was going on. So that, of course, made the demand to kind of have those qualities of life, to, to have this similar freedom stronger and stronger. And they, you know, they really didn't have that. They didn't even have bananas. Um, understanding the GDR is very important. Um, understanding the political structure. And when the GDR was founded in 1949, there were two big parties. There was the SPD. The SPD ex exists again today. It's the Workers' Party. It's uh, the oldest party in Germany and also the only party besides the KPD that resisted against the Nazis. That meant that many of their politicians were sent to concentration camps. However, they have something to be very, very proud of. Uh, in East Germany, and they had their first free election actually in 1946. Uh, in, in, in the more northern part of East Germany. And they kind of realized it ah, didn't work out so well for us, so let's never do that again. Didn't matter because the, the states didn't have to say anything in the German Democratic Republic. It was all about the central government. And now voting in the GDR was pretty interesting. It was a very simple democratic process. Um, you had to go vote. You had no other choice. Otherwise, you would have faced severe consequences. So always around 99, close to 100% went voting. And like, let's say, you know, this is a voting ballot. The way it went was you would get this ballot. You wouldn't have to cross anything. You just fold it and you put it. And that's, that's your vote. That's, that's the democratic process in the GDR. Very simple. Um, but, um, you know, it led to good election results all the time, surprisingly. And um, the, the Sozialistische Einheitspartei in the end was formed of the SPD and the KPD. They had to come together. The KPD is the Communistic Party of Germany. Um, they had to come together, they were forced to, so they would have more power. And th this SED had a huge, huge impact. And it can be kind of compared. If you were young, you would join the FDJ. It would be the free German youth. You had to do that, otherwise you would have faced consequences. And then as you get older, if you want to achieve anything, you had to join the party. So it was this entire process that you were emerged and that made you a socialistic person. That's what they called it. And there are so many more stories. Um, I, I, I read a book, for example, about a child. Uh, who grew up in East Germany and who was not a socialistic person who decided, you know, to kind of go against the system a little. I mean, it's a child, you know, it's 12, 12 years old maybe, and then she was sent to a labor-like camp to, to, to a so-called Umerziehungsanstalt, where children were sent and they were taught the right way. And that means, meant often brutal techniques, isolation, and many other things. Many things to be yet uncovered about that. And then there's something else, that's the Stasi, the Ministerium für Staatssicherheit. Now, the Stasi is truly remarkable, um, and not in a positive way. Um, because what the Stasi achieved was the complete, 
the complete um, observation of the population. They could, they could always spy on everyone because the system itself was so smart. That meant that so many people would work for the Stasi and then would all spy on each other. Neighbors, family members would spy on each other. Um, and it meant that if someone was attempting something, they mostly found it out. If you were digging a tunnel, someone, the chances are very high, they would find out. They would wait in vehicles in front of your house. They would search your house while you were at work. They knew so many things about you. And it even gets more unfortunate. After the war was torn down and Germany reunified in 1990, all those files, those huge, huge, huge amounts of files about everyone were released and people could find out, okay, my aunt was spying on me for 20 years. Um, so that had some pretty, pretty um, big uh, consequences for families and um, relationships. Um, I know many people who decide not to request their personal file because they were afraid that what, what would be in there would be not what they would expect. Here you can see someone um, that was listening, uh, that is listening to like, like a, someone that works for the Stasi. Um, I really recommend the um, book Stasi, the un untold story of the East German, German secret police. And there's also a movie, only with English subtitles, unfortunately it's in German, but it's called The Life of the Others, um, that looks into a Stasi school where people were taught how to you know, spy on other people with the techniques of the German, uh, East German government. Very, very efficient, yet at the same time, of course, awful. Um, now this is how, how the parliament looked like. Of course, you know, we have those ideals that um, mark uh, Marx, uh, Lenin, and um, yeah, I don't, I can't name the other person right now. <laughs> um, um, so this is how how the parliament looked like. But in the end, it didn't matter. All the decisions were made by the uh, Politburo, so it was more a formal thing. You know? um, uh, yes. Um, remembering, um, you know, the, the the terror that the German state, East German state, brought is very important. Um, I think it's always important that we remember the tears, the fear, and the death that the German war brought, yet also remember the love and the fight for freedom that brought it down. And over its course, 140 people died trying to escape from East Berlin, and over 100,000 people died uh, under the authoritarian East German government um, in either labor camps in the Soviet Union, or also trying to cross the East-West German border itself. Um, now let's take a quick look at the life in the GDR, how did life look like? Now if many people think about uh, socialism, you might think about long lines in front of stores like that. And that wasn't wrong for the GDR either. However, especially compared to other socialistic, <coughs> excuse me, I just got especially compared to other socialistic or communistic countries of that time, part of the Eastern Bloc, the situation in East Germany was fairly good. People had enough food, people had water, people had shelter, you know, those basic human demands, they were there. Um, you wouldn't have to wait in line in front of a grocery store, except if they had any exotic fruits like bananas that you couldn't get. You would have to wait in line, however, if there would be this new trendy pair of jeans that would come. And now trendy really depends on how, how you view it. Um, there, there was a huge black market going on, of course, also in East Germany. Um, because music, many songs, you know, the Beatles, everything, that was all illegal. That was needed to be all approved by the government. And interestingly, often the style of music that was allowed depended on the leader. So, like, that was, <laughs> so you had to listen to what, what, what uh, type of music your leader likes. And that's, I think, also very, very interesting. Um, uh, but yeah, that's what life in the GDR was like. Talking to my parents, um, you know, ask them how, how would you reflect on your childhood, on your early adulthood, and um, I mean, despite the fact that there were almost no opportunities and there it was pretty gray, it was not awful. It was not something that you would look back and say, oh, I, that was so, so bad for children, of course. Now, if you would ask someone who would be older, you know, I, I asked my grandparents, they would have a very different take on that because they, they were impacted far more then uh, my parents were in, they, my parents already were highly impacted by that. So um, yes, uh, East Germany in general, I think everyone would agree if they if you would say it was gray, and it was looked gray. You had those gray buildings, but in general there wasn't a lot of color. There wasn't you know too much too much joy or anything. 
Um, and you were kind of in a situation where there was more solidarity, however, because they were all in this together, they all had shortages, they all were you know, lagging some basic products, and so the communities really had grown, grown together during that time. However, you know that we have those iconic buildings that we would often associate with, with the Soviet Union, with, with the more Eastern Europe, uh, uh, with the more Eastern European part now. What is very interesting is, um, if you think about it, this probably wouldn't be your desired place to live. Um, not so much. Um, if you would talk to someone in East Germany in 1980, they would probably declare you as crazy if you would tell them, oh, I want to live somewhere in a nice downtown area, because, of course, the downtown area was not renovated. Many buildings weren't electrified. Um, you would have to share a bathroom. So that was your luxurious answer to all those problems. You would have your own bathroom. You would have electricity. Those, those things were here. So that was more the, more the exclusive part, actually. That, of course, changed dramatically after Germany reunified. Um, we will talk about this reunification process later. Um, because it is also something very, very difficult. And many people always see this event line as something that needed to happen. The wall felt, uh, was torn down. Now, of course, the next logical step is the reunification. But that is absolutely not the case. We will talk about that later. Um, and of course, also, the GDR left memories. Six, 60 million people lived um, almost, you know, some, some lived their entire lives there. Others were really shaped by it. And it also left a cultural heritage. It left customs and things that people were proud of, despite all the you know, unpleasanty, despite the dictatorship. They still had some things that they were proud of and that they wanted to keep. Now, the mentality after the reunification in West Germany was just like, get all that you know, East crap out of here and we will modernize this country in a week. So, um, of course, that didn't exactly work out because there are things and there are still things today that people are very proud of. The traffic lights, for example. If you ever should go to Berlin, and you're, you, you'll instantly notice when you're in East Berlin, that you'll see those things. Ampelmännchen, that's how we call them. Um, and they're very, very iconic, because, you know, they're kind of, I think they're kind of cool. I mean, it's like, like <laughs> who designed that? Um, <laughs> other things. Um, we have a special sparkling wine um, in uh, East Germany. Um, and also, out of the necessity, new brands were created, like Club Cola or Vita Cola, because we didn't have Coca-Cola in East Germany, so they just created their own brand. Um, also, many special candies, um, and then also very iconic, the Trabi. The Trabi, there was a car. Um, now, if you would have very responsible parents, and they would really, really love you to the moon and back, they would order your Trabi when you were born, because it weighed like 18 years, so... Um, <laughs> Very start early. <laughs> um, so they would order that Trabi for you. Um, it looks nice. I think you, you can still rent that today in Berlin. Um, it goes like, what, 60 miles top speed. It's not really fast. Um, but it was, was OK. You know, it worked out. There was a standard car. Everyone had it, if you wanted or not. I mean, more if you wanted. And they uh, also all, always needed to keep like, like gas tanks in the back, because there weren't that many gas, gas stations in the GDR either. Another great example of how the cultural heritage impacted East Germany until today is Sandmann. Now, um, I grew up, I watched Sandmann. It was kind of a TV show for smaller children. If they, before they go to bed, you watch Sandmann. It's, I don't know whether that's a thing, but it is. Um, so, until today, we have two versions of the Sandmann, the East German and the West German. <laughs> now, that's the East German, that's the West German. And some people take it as a very emotional issue and really have debates over this. I don't see why. Clearly, the, the East German one is better. I mean, it's way cooler. Um, yes. Another nice thing, uh, if you should ever be in Berlin, um, make sure to stop by the East Side Gallery. It's, it's not super touristy yet. It is beautiful because you can see the wall, uh, the, the Wall 75. That's the name of the final Berlin Wall that we saw until 1989. Standing there like that. Um, full with paintings, very creative paintings. And here, for example, you can see a chubby smashing through the wall. Um, probably the most iconic picture ever on that East Side Gallery <laughs> uh, was uh, Brezhnev and Honecker. Now, um, you know, th th that was like that was just something typical for for um, East for the Eastern area to do the socialistic brotherhood kiss. Um, I, I don't think there was much more meaning behind that. Um, <laughs> um, 
but yeah, how has this affected me personally? Now, I mentioned earlier, I grew up having all those freedoms and um, I think every story from every East German is an individual story. My parents certainly have caught up to the new economic system. They managed to adopt and I will talk about that a little later. Um, but I think having that background really makes you understand that freedom is not something that you can take for granted. Freedom is something that you, that our ancestors, maybe even our parents had to fight for. And I think as soon as we take that freedom for granted is when we lose it. And it's always, I think, important to be aware that there are people, no matter from which political direction, trying to attack all personal and individual freedoms. Um, I think that's, a, that's something that I took from that, um, just to see you know, how and also how different the story could have gone. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm able to be standing here today. You know, who knows, if the wall wouldn't have been torn down, I wouldn't have the freedom of travel. I wouldn't have the freedom to say what I want, wanted to. Um, wouldn't have the freedom to rant on YouTube about some political issue. Um, <laughs> you know, and those things that you just you know, have every day and you have always had that and um, yeah, really makes you think about that, that it's not something that has always been there and, um, and that there are always you know, dangers to our democracy. Um, so this is my mother. Um, she, um, when the war was thrown down, she uh, dropped out of high school. So at that point she dropped out of high school because I think, and I talked about, about this topic with her a lot, for her the system didn't give the right incentive. You know, in, the, in East Germany, let's say you wanted to become a um, teacher, um, you, um, it, it really depended on how high the demand was every year. So you want to become a teacher in 1975, not a high demand, too bad, you can't do that. We will assign you to, I don't know, to a nurse. And it doesn't matter if you want to do it or not, you have to do it now. Um, if you want to go to university, you want to do your A-level, you know, you want to try something greater, your personal abilities didn't matter that much. It was all about the political position that you were in, that your parents were in, how close were they to the party, and that in the end depend, um, determined the outcome. Now, my mom's side of the family, they had a lot of family in West Germany, and they weren't close to the party at all, the socialistic party. They were spied on a lot. Um, so they did not have that opportunity. My mom had to leave high school and dropped out. And if it was not for that event, she probably would have you know, done an assigned job for the rest of her life, just as many people did. But the fall of the Berlin Wall changed the route of her life dramatically. After the wall was thrown down, um, she redid her A-level, she did her bachelor, she did her master, and now she has a doctorate. So that's a remarkable, really remarkable development. Um, now my father is on a little different spot here. <laughs> Because, as mentioned earlier, he worked for the like like trading military-ish part of the East German government, and that was the only opportunity where you could leave East Germany without special travel requests, where you could get um, West money. That's what you needed, um, because East Germany had something called intershops. Now those intershops, they were like really really cool places to be. Like if you had the West money, you could go there and you could like get the Western chocolate, get the all those Western products that you could at the normal consume, consume, that's what the name was of the store for the normal people, what they couldn't get. In general, it's always a little ironic to looking back at the GDR. You know, they wanted to be this, you know, classless thing and uh, everything. Yet, if you look back, Erich Honecker, he had his private hospital somewhere in secret. And those were those elite stores where people from East Germany who had Western money could purchase stuff because Western money was worth much more for the government. So that's a little bit ironic. Um, my father was working for the trading marine, as mentioned earlier, to have this opportunity to leave, um, to travel. Um, but as soon as he heard the war was thrown out, he immediately quit it. <laughs> so, uh, and, and also redid his A-level, actually. Um, so talking about the fall of the Berlin Wall, I think it's always important to understand how freedom changed. How freedom changed lives, how pe freedom changed people, opportunities, how it changed a country, and in the end, an entire yeah, continent, pretty much. Because I always say the foundation of a stable Europe is a stable Germany. And we've seen that throughout history. Um, now, let's talk about the reunification process. I mentioned this earlier. Um, to view the reunification as the logical consequence of um, the fall of the Berlin Wall is oversimplifying, if not to say wrong. Um, However, in the summer of 1990, the East Germans changed their slogan from 
we are the people to we are one people. They wanted to see the reunification happening and they really, really wanted to, to just, yeah, finally be one again. And I think so did many West Germans. However, our European neighbors didn't like that idea, especially Margaret Thatcher was a strong, strong opponent of the, European, uh, of the German reunification. She once said, we beat the German twice and now they're back, when she heard about the reunification. Because, of course, there certainly was a certain fear of a um, too strong Germany again. And, you know, we are still having this debate, how strong of a military can we have? You know, how do we handle on Nazi pass? And I think we have found a very good uh, way here, but it also took a long time. That's a whole other pre presentation linked with the 68th movement. But um, Margaret Thatcher, a strong op opponent of the German reunification, um, and um, Helmut Kohl, um, that, no, I'd have to jump back a little. Helmut Kohl, that gentleman right here, he was the German chancellor at that time, and him and uh, his colleague, the uh, Secretary for Foreign Policies, Hans Dietrich Genscher, can be really made, um, yeah, uh, can be really linked to the successful reunification of Germany. Um, now it all came down to this um, special triangle, or sorry, special square that uh, we had with Gorbachev, you know, very, very, very progressive um, politician that the Soviet Union had at that time, who in the end said yes to a German reunification um, and, uh, and opposed ideas um, done by other Soviet politicians because there was the idea after the fall of the Berlin Wall, let's do the Chinese solution. Now, if you know Chinese history, if you know the Cultural Revolution, you know that the Chinese solution would have meant many deaf people, a lot of violence, the elites just being wiped out, and a fundamental new military-led state. Um, but he opposed that. And in the end, it was Gorbachev, the protests that we saw in 1990, 250,000 people just all together. That was, of course, especially for Kohl, something very moving, that something he's never saw as a saw as a politician. And then again, the Genscher coal combination, and then also, and that's very important, the United States of America with Bush, a politician that um, highly supported the German unity, um, despite uh, doubts from Thatcher and um, the French government. Now, what the French people said, and I thought that was something very interesting, already back in 1990, that was like, okay, you can, you can have that reunification, but we want European unity, you know? And um, that's something I'll talk about later, but they already thought about, you know, European currency, European military in 1990. Um, very remarkable. And um, then Kohl kind of started to, to rebel against everything that was um, expected to happen. Um, he introduced a 10-point plan without letting Thatcher know, without letting the French government know, without letting even Bush know. He just went out there said, yeah, this is our plan to reunify Germany. Um, now, this is, of course, a little oversimplifying. The political decisions he made were on great foundations of knowledge. And in the end, he was successful with it. Um, the four point plus two deal, that, those were the four powers, um, the four allies and the two East and West Germany. Um, finally, 45 years after the war ended, gave uh, Germany full sovereignty as a one United State. And they came together and really seized that moment of German unity. And I think um, Germany is always, you know, has always the past hanging over its shoulders. But after all, it was really a relief and affirmation that we can now live together finally after such a long time as Germans again. Um, there were a few deals placed inside that, a few deals that were also broken. One of them was that there would be no NATO base in East Germany. Now we have a NATO base in East Germany, so um, that changed a little. Um, also, the West German government needed to recognize the German borders. They still thought that Poland was part of <laughs> Germany. Um, so that took until 1989 to understand that, but they did, and um, they reunified. So that was something great. Um, October 3rd, 1990. Now, why not? Why is it on National Day, uh, November 9th, 1989? Why isn't it the fall, the day where the Berlin Wall was thrown down? I mean, that's a great event as well. And the reason for that is um, that November 1999 is a day of determination for German history because it has three different meanings, actually. The first one being, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I would say that's the single greatest event in a very long and very moved German history, the fall of this peaceful revolution. Yet, we also have the November Propogone. 
the Reich Crystal Night, Reichskristallnacht, the night that we saw an absolute rise. 100 Jews died in uh, Germany, and that started the beginning of this horrible, horrible, um, yeah, genocide. Also, on November 9th, the Weimar Republic was called out. A new beginning, a new chance, as many thought back then, and it also was, until it unfortunately was um, kind of captured by the Nazis, but by a democratic election as well. Another nice thing about the re German reunification is that the West German capital went from Bonn to Berlin again. And for some reason, <laughs> they decided to cover up the German parliament when there <laughs> um, no, but it was, that was the French artist Christo. He is a very good artist at covering things up. And now, <laughs> now it, they, they had millions of people looking at it. It was a huge event. Um, I, I, I don't know why they did that. It's really just, um, but um, the German capital moved again, the Reichstag. Um, I think a place like no other, which resembles the very moved German history. Until today, you can see in the Reichstag, since I you know, we used to work at the German Parliament, you can see those, uh, the Russians leaving their messages, and, and many of whom had to be removed after they renovated it, because it, you know, the, the, the Russian government saw pictures of that, and they thought it wouldn't be that good for diplomacy if they, if, they had, if they had that standing there in Russian language, of course, which was very understandable back then for the Russians, um, that they reacted that way, but it was like, you know, death to all Germans and something like that, so they removed that. But, and now the Reichstag stands here. Um, it is the most visited parliament in the world, the most visited parliament in the world, and now um, that is only a small part of that, it's only the parliament itself, and there are many, many more buildings in general. Um, something truly remarkable, though, about the architecture of the Reichstag is this thing. It's the, it's the thing that's on top, the glass thing. And if you sit in the parliament and you look up, and you can see those people walking there, you can see the people walking on top of you. Now, of course, there are many uh, reasons to do that, you know, for, the, for, for, for having a good climate, for you know, letting the sunlight shine in. But the main reason for that is to remind the politicians of transparency and to always remind them that the people are on top of them. So if they look up, they can see the people walking on top of them for who they actually do that, what they are doing, for what the debates are for. And then, last but not least, I think the single greatest achievement in European or in current European history is the European Union. It marks the beginning of a new era in Europe, an era of unity, an era of peace, an era of freedom, freedom of travel, for example, and of a united Europe um, like we have never seen it before. That is also the reason why in 2012 they won the World Nobel Prize, and I think why I, I think that only Europe can be, or the European Union is Europe's only future, other than that we have none. That's a, um, I think, yeah, very good statement. Now, last but not least, East Germany 29 years after. Now this is the part of the presentation where we must say, besides all those great achievements, there still is a certain inequality that we have between East and West, and let's think about that. When the wall was torn down, what did we have? We had the western side, side closely allied to the United States, economic powerhouse, um, huge GDP, and then we had the eastern side, bad infrastructure, close to the, to the Soviet Union, um, in general, low productivity, completely torn down, um, and of course that shaped East Germany or shapes East Germany until today. Um, first of all, we can see areas where we can see great change, especially in Berlin, the Brandenburg Gate, um, this is under the Linden, that's the street here, completely different. I mean, that's a day and night difference right here, heavily militarized. The Brandenburg Gate always really resembles that pretty well. And then you have it down here, full of life again. Now it's, of course, a tourist place like no other um, in Berlin, um, also pretty close to the parliament. And I think we have really come a long way and we can be proud, as Germans, of what we have achieved. Yet, um, there are also difficulties, but I think that entire Germany now can stand together proud as a liberal democracy, shaped and won by its past, yet looking into a bright future. After Germany reunified, it was clear that the situation in East Germany needed to be changed dramatically. So what West Germany did was take $2 trillion, $2 trillion and invest it in infrastructure and many other things. Um, they completely rebuilt the German highways. East Germany now has the best highways in Germany. Six lanes, no speed limit. <laughs> um, um, they renovated the um, rails. 
Um, that was a big problem as well because um, the Soviets just took out many of the rails to use them for themselves um, and uh, really managed to, to uh, build the foundation of an economically successful um, East Germany. Now, that didn't exactly work out the way there were attempts to subsidize West German uh, companies to go into East Germany and build something up. But what some companies did with the so called Treuhandsfonden was just to buy the company and then say, oh, you're bankrupt. We take the money, goodbye. So um, that really impacted the German, East German economy for a long time. And still today, 75 of the, um, excuse me, um, 30 of the largest German companies, they are kind of in a Dow Jones, we call the Ducks. Zero, zero of them have their headquarters in East Berlin or East Germany. So we can still see those economic differences. Yet, I always like to think about this, and we'll talk about this later, um, that as a generational issue. Um, especially this East West thinking, you know, for me, there's no way you could tell that I'm from East Germany. There's not a single indicator, neither by my German, neither by my look or anything. Um, you know, I don't have. have, have Standing, I'm from East Germany on my on my uh, face really big. So you couldn't tell it. I think it's in our generation, East and West really is nothing more or less than a um, geographical measurement, but not a soci socio-political indicator of how rich or poor you are. Another big problem that Germany is facing and that we definitely need a solution for pretty soon is a demographic change. Especially in East Germany, we have the problem that people start moving away from the rural areas. Now, only 10 of the 75 largest German city cities are located in East Germany. Um, that means um, that, of course, the attractive urban areas are more in the west, and the population, the general German population, will decline over the years. Germany is the um, biggest, second largest industry nation in the world after Japan, which is facing such a severe demographic change. Or retirement program, if it goes on like this, will soon end up working because the generational treaty just won't work if there are not enough young people and too many old people who just keep getting older. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, um, so you can really see the, the more red it is, the more difficult it gets. Um, that just shows something. And now, of course, we know okay, we have a problem with population. And there are two answers. Either Germans get more children, or we need to have a, someone else come in to solve that problem for us. And um, we were very fortunate that people, after all this time, that we are the country where people want to go to. And um, of course, in 2015, we had this um, migration crisis. Yet I always ask people, you know, we have such a big demand on our labor market. We are in a period of time in Germany where we have more jobs to offer than there, than there are people to employ. We have deficits in the areas for cooks because we have this, you know, we have not enough people working as mechanics. We need qualified immigration because otherwise our economy and our country will soon die out. We need diversification. So that was the logical reaction. Unfortunately, in East Germany, we saw kind of this as a reaction. It's the uh, right-wing party of Germany that kind of emerged and that's, um, can be kind of linked to um, a very, no, I need to see where I wrote this down on. Ah, um, I don't know if you know of David Goodhart, but um, he wrote a very interesting book about the anywheres and the somewheres, talking about the political change, phenomena like Brexit, you know, there are the anywheres who can, um, only, who are only about a quarter of our population, who can, you know, live anywhere, see many different things from different perspectives, and the somewheres. The somewheres who might be a little, you know, take a little longer, um, who take a little longer to adjust to a new surrounding. And the CDU, the German Conservative Party, the party of Angela Merkel, for example, kind of went away from the party of the everywheres. Um, and that saw the rise of the AFD. And now, unfortunately, for the first time since 1945, we do have a right-wing party in our parliaments again. It's not a Nazi party. It's also a right-wing extremist party. But it is a party that supports the isolation of Germany, nationalism, and has some very concerning views. And that is especially large, unfortunately, in West Germany. Here you can see a map of the election. Now, um, we have different colors for our political parties. Like, <laughs> 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 no, it's not California. Um, 
<laughs> so so um, they just got 10% in the last national election. However, the darker it gets, the more successful they were. For example, in Saxony, down here, they got, they got 30%, which made them the strongest party. Um, we have more than two parties, again. Um, and there's still other phenomena where we can see the German division. For example, how common is the name Ronny? Ronny is very popular in the East, as you can see still today. Um, how high is the income? And that's one of the biggest issues still in East Germany, is that people simply make less. Same work, they just make less. They make around 83.2% of what someone in West Germany would make. And that already takes into account the lower rent and the lower life living, um, living costs. However, today East Germany is a beautiful country. It faces challenges, but I'm confident that we will be able to overcome them. For example, in education, East Germany thrives, and I always see education as the great equalizer. This is Wannemünde, for example. This is where my parents are from. It's the harbor city. This is Dresden, also a beautiful city, except on Mondays. Um, this is <laughs> Leipzig, also very nice. And this is Potsdam, this is where I'm from. UNESCO World Cultural Heritage, Sans Souci, stands for Living Without Worry. It's the uh, city in Germany with the most castles per capita. So that's a pretty big achievement. And um, also definitely worth a visit if you should be in Berlin. It's only five minutes away. And I think the fall of the Berlin Wall reminds us to build more bridges rather than walls. And I just want to say thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask.